pandemic and its impact on New Jersey's environment. Uh, if you are just joining us, um, we are asking you in our chat box off to the right, uh, what changes you've noticed in the environment over the past two months uh, that seem out, out of place for where we are in the spring cycle? Uh, because today we're going to be talking with leading scientists in New Jersey that monitor and study our air, water, oceans, wildlife, and beaches. And we're going to be asking them what changes to the environment they're observing or not observing and what they anticipate may change in the future due to this current pandemic. My name is Tom Harrington. I'm the Associate Director of the Urban Coast Institute at Monmouth University, and I'll serve as your moderator today. If you're unfamiliar with the Urban Coast Institute, it is one of the five centers of distinction at Monmouth University, established to serve the university and public as a forum for research, education, and collaboration in the development and implementation of science-based policies and programs that support the stewardship of healthy, productive, and resilient, resilient coastal ecosystems and communities. I'm joined today by our communications director, Carl Zolotoba, who will provide all the technical magic to make this webinar work. And uh, he will be monitoring the chat box. So if you have any questions or observations you'd like to post, uh, we will make sure that we read them and ask any questions you, you have to our panelists for you. Unfortunately, we cannot support audio for all of our attendees today. So please place any questions or comments in the chat box. So uh, Carl, what, what do we have in the chat box? Anything interesting that um, you see that our, our participants have shared? So a, a couple of things have come in so far. Um, for example, we have uh, Blair Nelson who shared that early spring has turned into pre-summer since the outbreak began. Um, early flowers to early greens and we the New York skyline is more clearly visible. Um, Sean Sterrett who uh, commented about the uh, birds that he's seen in both in his yard and local parks. John Tiedemann, who pointed out that um, there were deer on the beach in Manisquan yesterday. If you haven't seen um, those images, they're, they're pretty striking. Um, I think the Asbury Park Press had them posted yesterday. Karen Keene, also that the New York skyline is much more visible from our vantage point across Raritan Bay. Um, Northern uh, uh, Gannets, uh, Claire Antonucci said that there is an osprey on her lawn. Um, and Stacy Ferrara, sky appears more blue and bright. So there, there seems to be a definite theme there in terms of um, air quality. Wow, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you one thing I've noticed in my backyard, it seems like the birds are a lot louder than they usually are. <laughs> Every time I go out there, I can hear them pretty clearly. Um, Great. So before we begin, um, I'll just briefly discuss the panel format for everybody that's attending. Um, I will introduce each panelist prior to their talk, and then each panelist will make a brief presentation. At the end of the pre last, pre last presentation, uh, there will be about 15 minutes for questions and answers that we could ask the panelists. So please keep uh, posting in the chat box any questions or comments you have that you'd like to relay to our panelists, and we'll ask them for you at the end of the presentation. Um, this webinar and the chat questions are, are being recorded and will be available on the Urban Coast Institute's webpage uh, a couple days after this event. So if you want to go back and review anything that's been discussed, uh, you will have an opportunity to do that. Um, so joining us today on our panel are Lewis Lim from the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, Dr. Josh Kohut from Rutgers University, Dr. Jason Adolph and Dr. Sean Sterrett from Monmouth University, and Ms. Kimberly McKenna from Stockton University. Welcome, panelists, and thank you very much for all being here today. So um, our first presentation will be from Lewis Lim. Lewis Lim is the chief of the Bureau of Air Monitoring at the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection and he holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Chemical Engineering from Lehigh University. Uh, Lewis began his career with the DEP in the Bureau of Air Monitoring, where he's responsible for quality assurance, equipment testing, site selection, air quality data review, data acquisition, system implementation, network design, and operator training. Uh, so very strong technical background from Lewis. Um, all right, Lewis, can you, oh, you're already loaded up. I'll leave the presentation. I'm loaded up, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Tom. And as Tom 
mentioned, uh, the Bureau of Air Monitoring in the BDP focuses on measuring ambient concentration of the criteria pollutants. And in this presentation, I will look at the uh, impact of the Stay at Home Directive on air quality in New Jersey. Uh, to summarize, uh, the following are closed. Offices, schools, non-essential retail, recreational and entertainment businesses, and non-essential construction projects. These um, closures have led to a 38% drop in uh, motor vehicle traffic and a 5 to 14% decrease in power use. Uh, I would like everyone to uh, remember these percent reductions. You have probably seen these satellite images from NASA showing the visible difference in air pollution levels in March 2020 versus previous years. Nitrogen dioxide, or NO2, combined with nitric oxide, also NO, are known as nitrogen oxides, or NOx, also NOx. And motor vehicles, oops, something oops. happened there. Yeah, it looks like you have to reshare. There you go. Okay, uh, where am I? Here I am. There. I don't know what happened, but anyway. Um, okay. You're good. I'm good. Okay. Going back, my uh, motor vehicles and power plants emit 80% of NOx in New Jersey. Okay. These images were highlighted in many news articles, as you know, which emphasize the improvement of air quality due to the COVID-19 lockdowns. This one article, the first one there, is from NewJersey.com, and it had a headline saying that air was the cleanest since 911. As soon as these articles came out, my bosses asked me, can we confirm these images using the DEP air monitoring data? Um, I thought about that, and I, and I realized that there are differences between satellite images and the DEP monitors located at ground level. The satellite images are measurements of NO2 concentrations in a column of air from the height of the satellite to about 50 meters above ground level. And the ground level data is highly variable from hour to hour, from day to day, because of reactions to ozone and VOC. And further, March and April are usually the cleanest months of the year due to seasonal meteorology. Um, about that headline saying that air quality today is cleanest since 911, average monthly pollutant concentrations are lower today than any month in 2001 for all pollutants. Here is a plot showing the average monthly NOx concentrations at our site in Elizabeth at exit 13 of the New Jersey Turnpike in 2001 and 2019. You can see that it's much, much cleaner today. So how can we look at DEP's data to measure the improvement in air quality due to the stay-at-home directive? but take into consideration day-to-day, -day, seasonal, and yearly variation. So I tried to answer this question by using a multi-year analysis of the last six years of NOx and fine particle, or PM2.5, data, both of which are emitted by motor vehicles and power plants. I compared two three-year periods, 2014 to 16, and 2017 to 19 with with the same months in 2020. This will reduce seasonality, high and low years. I used monthly NOx and PM2.5 data to reduce daily variations. And I looked at three urban monitoring stations in Camden, Elizabeth, and Jersey City where I would expect impact of the, um, the stay at home would be the most noticeable. And the conclusion, of course, is yes, there is an impact on air quality caused by the stay-at-home directive 
and it's most apparent in April 2020. I'll start with the NOx data, then with the PM 2.5 data. So here is the plot of the of Camden data. The Camden monitor is located for NOx. The Camden monitor is located in in an in an industrial area south of the aquarium and near the waterfront. The data in orange is the monthly average NOx for the years 2017 to 19 and blue for 2014 to 16. The dotted line, of course, is the 2020 data. The y-axis is concentrations of NOx in parts per million. Uh, note the seasonality of the NOx data. It's high during the uh, um, close to the winter months when there when ozone concentrations are low. So yes, there is. You can see that um, April shows a uh, decrease in NOx compared with those two three year periods. Um, Elizabeth, as I said earlier, is at exit 13 of the New Jersey Turnpike. Monthly NOx levels are generally higher here than in Camden, and you can see there is a big difference in, in April, a big drop in April compared to January, February, and March. The Jersey City Monitor is located in Journal Square. There's not as much traffic volume as Elizabeth in Journal Square, but lots of stop and go traffic. And similar, it has similar high levels of NOx as Elizabeth, as Elizabeth uh, Station, and a similar large drop in NOx concentrations for April. So that's it for the NOx. Let's look at PM 2.5. Let's re uh, going back to Camden for PM 2.5. You can sort of see that the PM 2.5 levels have generally less seasonality than NOx. And for Camden, 2020 was actually looking to be a low year compared to the previous six years for PM 2.5, even starting in January. Looking at the Elizabeth station, Again, lower year for PM 2.5 starting in January. And note that the PM 2.5 levels for Camden and Elizabeth are similar. And you'll see in the next slide, and the, uh, the, the y-axis are all the same, the, 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 the range. So at, at Jersey City, it's not at the same location as our NOx monitor but in the same general area. So like Camden and Elizabeth, monthly average PM 2.5 levels seem to be already declining since, March, since January 2020 compared with previous years. There's just a note there that we don't have complete data for Jersey City. So to summarize, I took the average of all the six years from 2014 to 19 and compared them with the 2020 averages for, the same, for March and April. So for NOx, you can see there is a 43 to 49% drop in monthly average concentrations in April 2020 compared with the average April concentrations for, from 2014 to 19. So there's definitely a drop and bigger in April than in March. For PM 2.5, there's uh, there's similar the, the decreases are for March and April are more close. They're sim more similar, so there isn't really a big difference between March and April. And there and Lewis, your slides dropped. Yeah. There you go. Yes, I'm coming back. I don't know why this is happening. There we are. And. Uh, so uh, again, uh, I'd like to conclude by the, the uh, NOx has a bigger decline than PM 2.5, although they both show decline compared with the previous six years. And remember, I asked you to, to uh, remember that um, the drop in motor vehicle traffic, the statistic that was mentioned in the earlier slide, and that was 30 
that was 38 percent and that was my alarm telling me that I'm at 10 the 10 minute mark so that's the end and so I'd like everyone to look at our website that's www.nj.gov slash DEP slash Airmon A-I-R-M-O-N and there is my email address in case you want to get in touch with me so uh so that is my presentation, and I will stop sharing, Tom, okay? Yeah, uh, that would be great. Well, thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. Amazing how quickly those values drop off um, in a month. So, Okay, our second presentation will be from Dr. Josh Koha. Uh, Josh is a physical oceanographer in the Rutgers University School of Environmental and Biological Sciences, where he oversees the Rutgers University Center for Ocean Observing Leadership. Dr. Kohut uses networks of ocean observing technologies to focus on the physical ocean processes that structure marine ecosystems. His projects range from coastal processes impacting storm intensity, beach water quality, and fisheries habitat off the coast of New Jersey, to regional scale questions centered on marine ecosystem dynamics within the coastal seas around Antarctica. I know Josh, and he travels a lot uh, back and forth from the southern hemisphere to the north hemisphere. So thank you very much, Josh, for being here. Thank you, Tom. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk in this event and thank uh, the Urban Coast Institute at Monmouth University for hosting. Um, my uh, slides here are going to weave through a story about what the, the COVID-19 impacts might be on the ocean. And when I was uh, confronted with this question from Tom and Carl and others, I uh, it made me kind of sit back and think about how immediate we might see impacts of a uh, mitigation policy that we're all under for COVID on an ocean environment that we've been studying for years. And so I start with just kind of introducing the environment itself. And this is a, uh, a map that's overlaid in Google Earth of sea surface temperature. And I show it to highlight how variable the ocean actually is. Uh, the colors here represent temperature. Uh, blues and purples are colder water. Reds and oranges are warmer water. And so you can see in our area off New Jersey, we're influenced by water moving up from the south in the Gulf Stream, that very warm red river uh, that's coming from north, the coast of North Carolina in this image, as well as polar influences with a, a cold current that comes around the Canadian Maritime and down into our waters, which you can see is this purple area. In addition to that, we have all the rivers and estuaries that are feeding all kinds of fresh water into the system. It's highly variable, and the plot on the lower right highlights that. Uh, what I'm showing there is the difference in the surface temperature of the ocean between the winter and the summer, on average, for the entire world. And what you see is there are a couple areas that, that show up with bright red color. And those are the areas where the temperature difference is greatest from summer to winter. And so the east coast of the US, the east coast of Asia are two places where we see big changes in temperature. And so when I was confronted with this question, I started to think, well, how could we see if a variable like temperature could be influenced by COVID? And so what I'm showing here are uh, plots of what we call temperature departure. And what that means is how different the temperature was on March 16th and May 8th in these two images compared to what a typical March 16th would look like over the last 15 years. So where you see red, it means that the ocean was warmer and the, the scale is there below the image in Celsius. So much of the coastal waters off New Jersey in March, before our stay in shelter, our shelter in place policies were put in, into play, uh, the ocean was very warm, uh, as much as three or even more than three degrees warmer than, than what we would expect in March. Um, now, going back to last week, as we look to May, we can see a pretty dramatic change hey. where the temperature of the ocean is starting to cool. We're seeing the colors go from reds to maybe more yellows and whites, and even areas of blue that are getting bigger. Um, this is an indication that the ocean is actually falling back to maybe more normal temperature. And so one might ask, well, if we're seeing this cooling effect on the ocean, does that have anything to do with 
the change in behavior that we're all under uh, since we've been responding to this pandemic. And I consulted my friend Dave Robinson, uh, the state climatologist, and uh, he put together this monthly air temperature departure. And what you see here are air in red, are months in which the temperature was warmer than expected, or than on average, and blue is where it's cooler. And so what we saw was, and one of the things that we're trying to, to wrestle with when we look at what ocean impacts might be of an event for, in this case, COVID, um, we have to look at that in the context of other variability, other forcings that are going on with the ocean. It's much more likely that our warm ocean in March was due to the very warm winter that you all experienced while you were here um, over the December to, to March timeframe. And then there was a change, and I don't have May on here. It hasn't been updated yet. Um, but I think we can all agree that it's been a cooler April and May than, than we've seen in years past. Um, we had, I don't know about everyone else, but I had snow on Saturday, which was very strange to wake up to, uh, coating of snow on the flowers in the yard. Uh, and so this cooling trend that we're seeing in the ocean is much more likely an effect of what's happening in the atmosphere in terms of temperature and weather, rather than what uh, we are doing in our response uh, to the pandemic. One thing we do see when we look at what the ocean impact might be is how we uh, are interacting with the ocean. And this is a plot showing the number of vessel transits into New York, New Jersey Harbor uh, based on the last four years of data. This is showing um, the transits up around 5,000. And then you can see in recent time, there's that strong dip in April of 2020. Uh, so we saw the number of vessel transits go from above 5,000 in a month to below 4,000 in a month. And so there's far less traffic on the ocean. And this is primarily with the AIS data that's being uh, used to track the larger vessels. Um, the impact that that might have on the ocean is in the scape. So if we reduce the vessel traffic on the ocean, we're going to reduce the contribution of ship noise to the soundscape in the ocean. And here I'm, I'm showing data from uh, a joint project between Woods Hole Oceanographic and the Wildlife Conservation Society, where there's actually a monitor out. Uh, I don't know if my cursor is seen here when I share my screen, but at this yellow star in the map on the upper right is a buoy. And that buoy has a hydrophone. So we can listen to uh, not only the background noise from the vessels and from other sources of noise in the ocean, but also marine mammals. And so what I'm showing here on the left is 2020. This is the data to date of the species. Uh, we're looking at fin whale here and the northern right whale. Uh, and we can see when those whales were heard by this buoy. And the time series under 2020 here goes from the beginning of January to, to, to today. Um, we can compare that because this monitor has been out for years. We can compare that with prior years. And I can't make statements today about what impact the reduction in vessels on the ocean might be having on the movement of these marine mammals. But we do have the data to start looking at it. It would not be um, proper for me to say, oh, the differences that we're seeing in this plot are only due to the reduction in vessels that are caused by the, the stay-at-home orders that have been put in place for COVID. Um, but when we put that in context with the other ocean variables that we're getting, we can begin to try and piece this story together over time. Another area where we're seeing uh, reduced effort and reduced activity on the ocean is in both commercial and recreational fishing. Uh, commercial fishing is seeing a reduction in markets. Uh, fishers are having to redefine supply chains and, and markets that they may try and sell their fish and catch to. Uh, on the recreational side, uh, charter boats are not permitted to operate at the moment. Um, and in some cases, there's limited beach access for access to a fishery if you're a recreational fisher. And I show as an example some initial data that uh, the Haskin Shellfish uh, Lab provided from Rutgers. Uh, these are the first three weeks of the Delaware Bay oyster season. And it's comparing last year to this year. Um, and you can see that dramatic reduction in effort in terms of what's been harvested from these different 
these are from these different fisheries. Uh, finally, there's there's an impact just on our ability to monitor and study the ocean. Uh, under this uh, policy, we are now uh, seeing many research facilities closed. Uh, the observer program, which is used uh, by NOAA to monitor catch from different commercial fishers, is not being is is not in operation today. Uh, Fed surveys, uh, research cruises are being postponed or canceled. Uh, as of right now, there's a moratorium on all oceanographic research cruises uh, funded by the National Science Foundation until the end of the summer. Um, there's also uncertainty in what type of effort we as uh, a science community can take. What are we allowed to do? What, what are we permitted to do in terms of access to the ocean, getting our uh, sensors to the ocean to make those measurements? And these time series are very critical, not only to our understanding of the ocean, but they provide valuable input to management and policy. And I show an example of a, a report that the Northeast Fishery Science Center at NOAA just released. It's the State of the Ecosystem Report. And they use these time series of data to look at, in this case, species distributions and how they're moving over time. And you can see this time series began in the 1960s. And so there's a risk in terms of how we understand and monitor the ocean in terms of how these time series are able to be maintained and still follow the, uh, the response that we're all under uh, to COVID. Uh, the good news, and I'll, I'll end with some thoughts here of good, good news on this is that uh, there are a lot of automated systems out there. There are uh, decades of work that have been done to develop ocean technologies to allow us to monitor the ocean conditions so that we can see if COVID is having an impact. We can differentiate it from years past. Um, a lot of these systems are running today with everyone safely at home monitoring how satellites, we saw some satellite data earlier today, uh, how radar stations on the beach are running, autonomous robots that are being put into the ocean. And each day we're still providing forecasts of these ocean conditions so that they can be used to not only research the ocean, but make informed decisions and management policy. And so I'll end with, with when we think about the ocean impact, uh, we're asking questions like, we have a natural experiment going on with the ocean. What happens when human behavior changes so abruptly uh, and how that, that human existence interfaces with an ocean environment? Um, how does that natural and socioeconomic system respond to such a dramatic shift? It is a natural experiment that we're undertaking right now that because of the fact that we are monitoring and measuring some of these different parameters from both the natural system all the way through the social and the economic aspects of the ocean and our links to the ocean, uh, it's important that we monitor all of that. And I'll leave with a quote that recently came out from Craig McLean, a New Jersey native. Uh, he's the acting chief scientist for NOAA and the, uh, the AA for OAR, the Oceanic and Atmospheric Research. And he says that this unique view into the relative stillness we find ourselves in is only possible because of existing baseline knowledge that NOAA has built over decades of monitoring, modeling, and research. And I would broaden it. Uh, I, I think there's a, you know, and I think Craig would agree that there's a great community of people that are looking at all these different aspects. And it's only because we have these time series and we have these existing baselines that over time we can start to understand what the specific impact of COVID might be on the variations that we're seeing in not just ocean temperature or um, ocean sound, but all aspects of the ocean. Uh, we can build off of, of that knowledge that we've had from decades of work. And I uh, leave my email there. If there's any questions, I'm happy to uh, I'm happy to answer those. Wow! Thank you very much, Josh. What a thought-wracking presentation. It's amazing, yeah, that, that, that we have this opportunity to really learn uh, about a dramatic shift in the environment. Um, okay, uh, our next panelist um, is Dr. Jason Adolph, Endowed Associate Professor of Marine Science in Monmouth University's Marine Environmental Biology and Policy Program. Professor Adolph's research is focused on the field of phytoplankton ecology and evolution, and he has made significant contributions to our knowledge of harmful algal blooms in the marine waters. He, is con he has conducted harmful 
Algal Bloom Research in the Chesapeake Bay, the Swan River Estuary in Perth, Western Australia, and in Hilo, Hawaii. Uh, Jason, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Todd. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks, everyone. My talk's going to be a little different. Uh, I don't have data to show effects like the last few talks I've had, but I'm, I'm more talking about a um, an idea, a concept going forward um, that has to do with using existing citizen science programs to maintain monitoring efforts kind of in the way that uh, uh, Josh just talked about uh, while we're all challenged with this shutdown. So this is my attempt at uh, some people had, had commented on the, the New York City skyline. Not a scientific view because it's different seasons, but um, as some people noted, it's definitely obvious when you look across from Sandy Hook, as we are seeing here, that the, the New York City skyline is much clearer due to um, the reduction in air pollution. It just makes the point to me that any citizen who's looking can, can notice these environmental changes that are, that are happening now. Um, so my, my point in the talk today is that we've seen these rapid changes in, in air quality, wildlife sightings, um, but we also have these existing citizen science programs um, that are uniquely situated to detect changes in systems that they've been monitoring. Um, and they're uniquely situated because, I hope you can see my laser pointer here. Um, they're uniquely situated because they, they have their sampling equipment and they're able to go out in the environment and continue and monitoring what they've been looking at, unlike many of us who can't get into our labs um, and do any kind of meaningful work. And what we'll learn from this continued monitoring is which aspects, we'll learn more about which aspects of our environment are, are most sensitive to things that we're that we do and that we're not doing as much of anymore. The program I want to emphasize here is called uh, CLONET, the Coastal Lakes Observing Network, started by Monmouth University's Urban Coast Institute uh, back in 2018. We work here on the Monmouth County coastline in uh, what are called coastal lakes, these small lakes, uh, the names of which are in these black background boxes here. Uh, we have citizens, about 35 to 40 of them, that work in seven coastal lakes. Their sampling stations are shown by these little secchi disc icons. Um, and uh, the thing to notice about coastal lakes, uh, they're, they're characterized not only by their location along the coast, but also by connection to the Atlantic Ocean, which gives some of them a little bit of salinity, but for the most part, um, their freshwater system. They're also small lakes that are um, surrounded by these highly developed, in, in these cases, highly developed, highly populated urban watersheds that have a big impact on their, their water quality. A lot of that is through stormwater uh, runoff. Okay, got it. Stop, come on. So through the CLONAP project, what we did was supply and train citizen scientist groups at each of these lakes with basic water quality kits and, and uh, oh. training in how to take those oh. measurements. Excuse me. That includes a, a web-based data portal for them to upload the data, which makes a, a huge difference in actually being able to turn around the data quickly and, and organize it and under, try to get some meaning out of it. Um, these pictures here show some of the group sampling. This is, these are pictures of the, of the uh, citizen volunteers uh, in training that occurred over, the, over uh, summer 2019. But more recently, what we see through our Facebook page are images like this of people going out and simply following social distancing guidelines and continuing uh, sampling as they go. So we've learned a bunch of things through the citizen sampling. I don't want to go into a lot of detail on the data here. Um, this is uh, temperature. The, the squares on the graph are different lakes compared to a 1977-78 study of Deal Lake. And you'll notice that the temperature in the lakes that we've been measuring, uh, including Deal Lake, which is the black line, uh, the old study, are much higher than they used to be. That's just one example. And another example is 
um, Becky death step. And uh, what this is is a measure of lake transparency, and it's also considered an integrative indicator of, of lake trophic status. Basically, uh, a lower number is worse, a higher number is better. And you can see across these lakes that there are lakes like Wesley down here, Sylvan, Takanaska have relatively high values, and then places like Sunset Lake, which are highly impacted and, and not in great shape, have very low um, uh, Secchi depth. And then you also see some seasonal changes like in Deal Lake, Hads in the summer, clear, clear in the winter, and then Spring Lake, you see a, a declining trajectory. So while the um, citizen monitors are doing their thing, my students and I sampled 10 lakes, measuring additional parameters that, that citizens can't do because they don't have labs and microscopes. This included microscope counts of harmful algal blooms and uh, chemical nutrient analyses that were actually done by the New Jersey DEP. It's a very busy slide, but I just want to draw your attention here to make the point that what we found through this analysis was that comparing cab abundance measured as phycocyanin fluorescence here versus total nitrogen here, um, the more total nitrogen was in a lake, the more halves were in a lake, which leads to the conclusion that these lakes, the halves in these lakes, the harmful algal blooms, are driven by nitrogen loading. And I'll come back to that as important in a second. <coughs> Excuse me. Real quickly, I just want to mention that we also study harmful algal blooms in the Hudson River and estuary system, particularly in the San Diego Bay, Navasink Shrewsbury system, and we've been focusing on this part of Branchport Creek where we found a massive bloom, 300 to 400 micrograms per liter chlorophyll. If you're familiar, you know it's a high number. Excuse <coughs> me. Dominated by a, a red tide dinoflagella called Akashio sanguinea, which is a potential fish killer, and associated with the known areas of low oxygen in that, that creek. And if you know Branchport Creek, and I know some of the people on the participant list are very familiar with it, you know that there are fish kills there that are caused by low oxygen. What we also know now are two additional things, is that that low oxygen is beneath a, a massive bloom uh, that's there the last two summers, at least, of a potentially fish-killing dinoflagellate. And Aaron here uh, has also figured out that nitrogen is what drives these blooms, again. So if we look at this kind of sampling done by citizens, done by, by students who are going to be acting like citizen scientists this summer, what can we look for in this coming year? Well, we, if we know one thing about uh, coastal phytoplankton ecology, it's that um, people bring the nitrogen. The more people, the more nitrogen. That's been shown in a lot of different situations. Uh, and we know that where these estuaries and lakes exist, it's an area where the population increases 73% in the summer compared to the year-round population. And on peak days in the summer, holidays and weekends, it's more like a doubling of the population. So if we don't see that kind of increase in population, there's a very uh, good chance that uh, the, the estuaries and lakes that we've been looking at will look different. And that's something we'll be looking for. I also wonder if the reduced vehicular traffic will reduce atmospheric deposition of nitrogen to these systems uh, and affect what's growing in the lakes and estuaries. Finally, uh, scientists are anticipating about a 5% drop in global CO2 um, this year from this uh, stay-at-home order and, and shutdown, which can, in fact, uh, could impact local CO2 levels even more. And we know that harmful algal blooms are driven to some extent by elevated CO2 levels. And the last thing I want to say is that of, of all the good things that we see uh, in, uh, in the environment as a result of this stay-at-home order, we have to ask ourselves, how do, we, how do we achieve these things without going through a global pandemic? Because the pandemic is definitely a bad thing, no matter how good it is for the environment. Um, so we need to use that to to learn and frame questions for understanding how our activities impact different environments. 
And I think that um, doing that through citizen science monitoring groups um, is a great strategy that's, that's tenable through, through a shutdown like this. So um, that's all I have to say, and I want to thank the people that were contributing to this project, and thank you all for your attention. And here's some links for further information. Thanks again. Thank you, Jason, and thanks for all your hard work with the citizen science groups. I, I know from what I've heard, they appreciate working with you and your students so much. So uh, good luck to, to collecting more data during this uh, stay-at-home order. Thanks, okay, Tom, and next... thanks for including us in this uh, important conversation. So, oh, my pleasure. Um, okay, our uh, next presentation will be by Dr. Sean Ferris. He's also an assistant professor of wildlife ecology at Monmouth University. Uh, he specializes on basic and applied research related to ecology, conservation, and management of reptiles and amphibians. More broadly, Dr. Sarah is interested in, the understand in understanding the influences of anthropogenic threats on wildlife populations and identifying effective and efficient management strategies for wildlife restoration and conservation. Uh, so this may be particularly interesting to you, Sean. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, loud and clear. All right. Great. Thanks. Um, all right. So thanks, uh, everybody, for being here. Thanks to the uh, Urban Coast Institute for putting this on and for uh, to Carl and Tom for, for helping us uh, get through it. Um, so today I want to talk to you about the question, um, how could COVID-19 and the kind of shutdown, stay-at-home orders, how could these influence wildlife? I'm going to speak generally about wildlife. Life. Um, sometimes globally, I'm going to emphasize New Jersey things, um, but I'm, I'm going to talk a, a, in some cases a little bit more generally. Um, I'm not a virologist, I'm not an ep epidemiologist, and I'm not a public health expert. So just take me as a as a wildlife ecologist as I as I move through these slides. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about um, is I want to talk about bats because uh, bats are everywhere right now. As we um, they're in the headlines everywhere and. Uh, there's some pretty major negative stigma on disease-associated wildlife um, when it comes to any diseases or viruses that affect humans. And right now, it's all about bats. So um, one out of five mammals on Earth is a bat. There's more than 1,200 species across the globe. And there's nine that are found in New Jersey um, <clears throat> that are full or part-time residents in New Jersey. If you go out in your in your yard uh, around dusk, you can sometimes see bats um, fluttering around, if you're lucky. Um, bats have a very poor, poor reputation for their connection to viruses and diseases. And bats carry viruses, um, often without harm or symptoms to themselves, um, but so do lots of other animals, uh, including ro rodents, ungulates, and humans. Um, bats, for a, a lot of very in-depth reasons are um, can carry lo lots of different viruses, um, uh, perhaps equal to or more so than other wildlife. So that's, that's an interesting thing just about them. Um, this novel coronavirus, the, the cause of COVID-19, likely originated from a bat, but it is not um, the, the uh, widespread outbreak of COVID-19 on humans is not the result of a bat-human interaction. There was an intermediate host that was likely involved in the spillover event. Um, because of all this negative stigma, um, there are reports that bats are being persecuted, in, in, uh, at least in, in several places that I've, that I've learned, um, <clears throat> because of their reputation. So um, this is something that's bad. There are, um, uh, there's nothing that anyone's going to, um, they're not going to positively influence the, the thing that COVID-19 is how COVID-19 is impacting humans by doing something bad to bat populations or to bat habitat. So, so that's a bad thing. Um, the more true culprit of wildlife pathogen spillover events is due to illegal wildlife trade, habitat alteration, and logging practices. Basically anything that we do to alter our environment that gets us closer to wildlife, these are the things that are going to influence um, those potential spillover events. So my, my message here is that wildlife are not at fault for COVID-19. This is a uh, completely a human behavior issue related to uh, this viral spillover event. Um, and there's, I'm just going to talk, you know, this is just about bats, but there's, there's other negative stigma on other wildlife um, with other, other diseases. And because of this, there's this, been this remarkable um, new supergroup of bat 
researchers and conservationists that have uh, that's come together in the last couple months. The Global Union of Bat Diversity Network has uh, come about. They have a Twitter, uh, a Twitter and Facebook page. Um, this is a coalition of, of multiple bat scientific advocacy groups from around the world working together to improve the reputation of bats in general. So um, just my message again, bats are not at fault for this. Um, and we should be funding people to study, to study and research uh, uh, bats and viruses, and, and I've, uh, I've got a lot of colleagues that do that work. All right, so the, the bigger question that people are, are talking about in lots of articles that are being written about right now is, is how do the impacts of stay-at-home orders influence wildlife in general and, and certainly uh, here on the, uh, in New Jersey and on the Jersey coast. And um, I'm still relatively new to New Jersey, uh, but this is, this is what I imagine, and this is definitely what you get on the Jersey coast, at least in, in certain parts of New Jersey. Um, lots of beach activity, lots of, of beach tourism, and lots of beach recreation. And of course, when things close down, what happens? And um, for organisms that are closely tied to coasts, um, the, the beach closures are probably a, a really um, interesting uh, experiment. Um, as, as Josh put it earlier. Um, so beach closures, closures and, nest, and nesting shorebirds are, the, are a big thing that come up. There are lots of, of um, uh, shorebirds that move through and nest on, on Jersey shores. Um, so many shorebirds require beach habitat for nesting. If you've been to um, Sandy Hook or, or several other places uh, um, on the Jersey coast, um, you'll see places that are designated as, uh, as uh, specific places for, for shorebird nesting. Um, there are many human behaviors that overlap with and disturb nesting. Um, certainly pets, dogs can devastate uh, nests of birds. The trash that we put on beaches, the potential supplemental feeding that we do, and just interactions that could potentially disturb um, uh, nesting shorebirds is, is a bad thing for them. So widespread beach closure, closures are probably good um, for, for shorebird nesting in the short term. Um, I would say that uh, I would be pretty, pretty confident in saying that they're, they're, they're really good. With wildlife uh, that requires, um, usually requires uh, longer term data and study to, to actually figure out if there's a signal for this. Uh, but there are long-term studies of, of these animals going on, even here on the Jersey coast, and so we'll probably learn about that in, you know, in, the, in the near future. Um, and you know, human beach recreation and successful shorebird nesting is absolutely possible. It requires human behavior changes, so as the beaches start to open up, you know, keep in mind that we're still in, we, you know, we're going to be in, in um, shorebird nesting um, now and, and uh, into the next few months, so it's it's important to remember that as the beaches start to open up. So there's some a, a couple other really remarkable um, wildlife migrations that have overlapped incredibly <laughs> remarkably with the COVID-19 shutdown in New Jersey, and I wanted to talk about um, just two of them real quickly, and and then talk more about one of them. Um, the neotropical migrant birds are, are moving through right now. If you're a, a birder or a, a wannabe birder like me, you uh, have your binoculars with you at all times. And, you know, I've been out to a few parks and I've seen tons and tons of birds moving through. Um, that's happening right now, so that during the shutdown. The pond breeding amphibians uh, migrate every single year, um, usually in March through April. And here in New Jersey, it happened a little earlier, uh, around the time in which things were getting shut down. So decreases in human activity in natural areas, um, forests, wetlands, um, and even on roads, and by that I mean reduced traffic volume, is probably good for, for wildlife. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about amphibians in the next slide. So conversations that I've been having with my colleagues and, and trying to read about and think about um, come down to, um, you know, how does this shutdown, how does the response to COVID-19 influence amphibian migration survival, and have there been decreases in traffic volume that would, that would potentially influence that? So as, as Lewis mentioned earlier, um, uh, reported a 38% reduction in, in vehicle traffic. Um, there have been, I, I imagine that was probably the case. Um, so pond breeding amphibians require vernal pools for laying their eggs. 
Um, on the screen here, you can see a, a spotted salamander and a wood frog here, both on a road, uh, moving across a road. Um, roads are major obstacles for, um, for laying eggs, and they often end in mortality for many of these, these animals. Uh, we wrote a paper last year um, which was simulating populations of uh, spotted salamander. This is a figure from that paper just showing that they move from, um, so uh, most amphibians that are pond breeding live in forests most of the year, and then they have to breed in a wetland, usually a vernal pool. And in, in many complex landscapes that have uh, a network of roads, they have to cross a road to get there. So the adults move across the road to get to the breeding wetlands. The adults move back across the road to get to the forest habitat. And then the, um, the metamorphs that, come, that will hatch from the eggs will also move back across that road. So roads are major obstacles for, um, for the entire life history of, of many of these animals. So many states uh, have uh, been reporting 30 to 60 percent uh, traffic volume reductions during the, the COVID-19 outbreak. And we know that reduced traffic volume is really good for amphibian survival and population persistence. Um, it's a fairly clear relationship in, in most cases. As you increase the amount of traffic volume, you increase the uh, amount of, of any um, individuals that are migrating the population to be killed. So, so traffic volume is really bad for, um, uh, for salamanders, for frogs. And this also goes for things like turtles and snakes and other things that move around landscapes. Um, and, you know, just a plug, there's also a lot of citizen scientist efforts that are going on for, uh, for this system as well, as we've, we've heard from the last couple speakers. Um, it's uncertain how, uh, how citizen scientist engagement will be influenced by the outbreak, um, but so in this case, citizen scientists actually go out and help move uh, animals across the road during these very predictable migration events. And I, I spoke to a, a colleague in, in Vermont uh, early this morning, just, and she mentioned that lots of citizen scientists were still engaged, but her numbers were lower than normal. Um, so um, it's really kind of uncertain how citizen science is going to change um, because of the outbreak. Um, the bigger, the, the, I think originally when we were just starting to understand that this is going to be a long-term response, uh, people were starting to think about how is this going to influence wildlife? And some of the, the earliest articles that came out were about, um, you know, tourism stress relief for wildlife. This is a this is a tweet from Kruger National Park, kind of showing that you know there was there was a pride of lions that were hanging out in the road where there would normally be um, tourist buses and trucks and things like that. And um, so it was possible that you know you're going to get rid of the people. To everything shut down, get rid of the people, and all the animals are going to come out, and they're going to sing songs and do things like that. Um, and I think that's the, uh, the on-the-surface thought about this. But there have been a, a number of other articles that have come out talking about how, um, you know, this one is the, the coronavirus lockdown is a threat for many animals, not a blessing. Um, and this other one, um, conservation in crisis, ecotourism collapse threatens communities and wildlife. So there's a little bit more of a nuance into um, how the outbreak and the response is going to influence uh, particular groups of animals that are um, aided by conservation that is directly influenced by ecotourism. So there is a, a concern that there's um, potential overshadowing or halting of conservation efforts, particularly through um, resources, the time and the money, uh, that comes from ecotourism. So the, the COVID-19 outbreak um, probably equals a, a, a major decrease in tourism that's, that's easily noticeable and, uh, and a potential decrease in conservation funding, especially for um, non-governmental organizations that do a lot of the work for, um, for uh, especially for critically endangered animals. I've got on the screen here a, um, a, a photo of a snow leopard and a, a northern white rhinoceros. I think there's something around 8,000 snow leopards left. There's only a couple northern white rhinoceroses left. So um, this could potentially influence um, critically endangered animals in a couple different ways. Um, it definitely decreases the amount of money that, that groups have to do this work. But for things that are super rare, super critically endangered, um, like rhinoceroses, um, that are actually um, protected 
uh, that, you know, I know of a, a few situations like rhinoceroses, there's a few tortoise populations that are actually protected by armed guards. If you have decreases in conservation funding, you potentially have decreases in the ways in which you would pay these guards, in which you would do that protecting of these animals. Um, so these are a, a few of the interesting nuances that could potentially influence, influence wildlife. Um, I tried to look into um, how this might influence New Jersey wildlife, and I'm not finding a signal of that from any of my colleagues. Um, but I think it's, it's yet to see, you know, we're, we're yet to find out how um, funding situations in New Jersey will actually influence um, partic particular New Jersey wildlife conservation. And I'm going to stop there. I, 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 would, I would say that, um, you know, uh, again, thanks for, for everybody for being here. Um, the, the one lasting, uh, the last message I'd want to send everybody here is that, um, again, we're, we don't really know how, how COVID-19 and the response to it are going to influence wildlife. But we do know that uh, wildlife are always struggling in the, you know, in the face of, of human disturbance. And uh, New Jersey being one of the most human-dominated states in the country, um, it's, it's a big thing here. So um, if you're going to do something for wildlife, I would, I would definitely urge you to, um, if you have the money to spare, to spend money on, on wildlife organizations. I would certainly suggest voting for people who think about wildlife uh, conservation. And I would think about, you know, what's one behavior you can change once we open up that might potentially open, uh, that might potentially influence wildlife in a positive way. And I will stop there. And thank you all. Thank you, Sean. Very, very interesting. Um, OK, I know we're running a little behind. So I'll get to our final presenter of uh, this afternoon. And that is Ms. Kimberly McKenna. She is the Associate Director at the Stockton University Coastal Research Center. And she has over 25 years experience working in coastal processes research and shoreline management. Ms. McKenna is a registered professional geologist in Delaware and Texas, receiving a master's degree in geology at the University of South Florida. Uh, she has authored several publications, including those used as the scientific basis in the development of state legislation, rules, funding programs, as well as peer-reviewed science audits. So, Kim, thank you very much for being here. Great. I hope you all can hear me. Um, I'm Kim McKenna, and um, I, these presentations have been absolutely wonderful. Um, I will be talking about physical beach conditions. Um, because we are still collecting data, I'm going to focus mostly on um, some of the long-term trends that we've seen um, in the past. Um, and then talk about some of the observations that we've seen um, this spring and, um, and maybe discuss a little bit about the future. So I'd like to acknowledge my, um, some of the staff that have been out collecting the data during the pandemic. And they're listed below my name there. Um, a, a fairly large group of folks have been in and out of the office and out on the beach. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Coastal Research Center, we're located in South Jersey. We have uh, easy access to the water, the ocean. Uh, we were uh, established in 1984 by our executive director, Dr. Stu Farrell. Uh, what we do, we are a research um, arm of the university. Uh, we're predominantly undergrad uh, institution. And we bring, um, we're basically training the undergrads um, to be future scientists and uh, coastal scientists. So we do, we have a lot of projects um, that involve data collection, data analysis, and we provide technical assistance to municipalities, to the state, as well as to some federal agencies. But what I'm really going to be focused on is, um, this talk will be focused on, is the New Jersey Beach Profile Network, NJBPN. Um, it is funded uh, by the New Jersey DEP, Division of Coastal Engineering. Um, it was established in 1986 um, in response to Hurricane Gloria. Hurricane Gloria um, created, uh, caused tremendous damage to the beaches. And there was no system for quantifying those uh, losses of the beach. And so um, the DEP started this network and Stockton, our executive director, worked with the DEP folks. And we've, since then, we've been monitoring the coast uh, for 34 years now. What we do is we go out with a team, um, with a survey crew. Um, we measure the dune, the beach, and the inner surf zone elevation. Uh, we have 171 profile sites located along the um, 
Monmouth Ocean, Atlantic, and Cape May County uh, coasts. Uh, we have at least one site in every oceanfront municipality. Um, the sites uh, also are in Raritan Bay as well as in Delaware Bay. Um, we cover 49 communities along um, this stretch of the shoreline, uh, three federal properties uh, and two state parks. Uh, we go out twice annually, the spring and the fall. The spring is to measure the deflated beach. So um, in the winter, we tend to have um, big storms. So this is when the beach is at its most vulnerable. So we want to see what that looks like in the early spring. And then in the fall, to measure the inflated beach. So when you've had these calm conditions over the summer, um, what, what does the beach look like when it's filled up and looks its best? Uh, timing is very important to us to get out and to get these long-term data sets. Um, and so we have to be done before the beach is open for recreational use. So we tend to really um, emphasize a lot of work in the spring months um, so that we're out of there before 4th of July. Um, what we use the data for is to determine um, shoreline and volume changes at these particular sites. And then we can, with that information, we can look at um, beach nourishment performance. We can look at erosion hotspot areas as well as depositional areas. So our usual limitations are the weather, the waves, the tides, and environmental windows. Um, weather uh, from January through April of this year, 2020, we really haven't had any big weather events. No elevated waves, no big flood events, which is actually a good thing. We didn't see them last year either. Um, we do keep our own kind of uh, log of when like a northeast swell occurs or maybe a coastal well occurs, but we keep that just at the Coastal Research Center. I pulled the data from um, NOAA buoy 44091, which is located off of Barnegat Inlet in about 60 feet of water and looked at the, the wave heights and the average wave heights that were only about four feet um, that, that far offshore. Our highest wave heights offshore were about 14 um, feet. Um, but we didn't see those you know, close to shore and what we see at the beaches. Um, with respect to tides, we like to collect our data when, during the low tide. Um, so that way we can maximize um, the dry beach as much as possible and minimize the, the time that our um, prison folks are out in the water collecting the inner surf zone data. Um, and then our, uh, one of our other big limitations is that we, we have to work around environmental windows. Um, usually we start up in late February to collect some of the data at um, some of the, the state sites and, and the federal sites um, because they're the, those part, that part of the shoreline uh, is, has a lot of um, migratory birds that stop and nest, and those, several of them are endangered or threatened species. So we'd like to be out of there by uh, March 15th. Um, our, what, when you have these COVID limitations, um, many times we've had the beaches have been closed. Um, there's been police activity there and physical barriers um, that limit the access to the boardwalks and the beaches. Um, we reached out to the DEP. They gave us a letter of permission to go out and continue our monitoring efforts. Um, we've also uh, contacted each of the municipalities um, with the sites, and we have, we've had uh, full-on support from them. Uh, to, for us to go out there. We're actually not out there very long, maybe a, a couple hours at the most. Um, we have completed our spring surveys in Cape May County, Atlantic County, uh, and Ocean County, and now we're working our way towards Monmouth County. Um, our, our biggest um, concern is, and number one priority, is staff and student safety. Um, you can see the, the two um, guys here holding the prisms. They're, they are students. Um, and they're lifeguard trained, um, they have no fears of the ocean, and, and they're in the ocean all, all year long since they work with us. Um, when they travel, we take, for a team of four, we take two vehicles. Um, they all wear masks. Um, when they're out on the beach, um, just the nature of the work, they uh, make sure that they're spaced every 10 to 15 feet um, when they're taking the measurements of the beach profile. 
So let's go, I'll go quickly over the, what the data look like and the trends. Um, the next four slides are, one, are examples from each of the four counties. Um, the first one is at Cottage Road, Monmouth Beach. If you look at the top figure, um, this is the, the, what the beach profile looks like. Imagine you standing on the beach and you see the, the dune and the, the beach and, and then uh, this zero line is like our hypothetical uh, water line um, and then this would be considered the inner surf zone. When you look at this uh, lower left um, figure, this is that same profile, uh, all of the fall or inflated beach profiles um, over our, our period of um, long-term trends. Uh, so it would be all of the falls from 1986 to 2016. And then the lower right, uh, it shows the shoreline position in uh, green and the cumulative volume changes in red. This is an erosion hotspot. It's down drift of a groin. Um, it's also part of the Monmouth County Beach Hills that we, and has been nourished for um, four times, and that's where you'll see this big, uh, wide berm here. Um, that's pretty typical of beach fill. Next, as you move down into um, Northern Ocean County, Ortley Beach. Ortley Beach, if you look at this top figure and this uh, form right here, that's an engineered dune. Uh, Ortley Beach was nourished for the first time as part of the Manasquan Inlet to Barnegat Inlet Beach Fill um, that was constructed in 2017 and 18. Prior to beach fill, the, you, won't, you do not see that data here um, since we stopped to 2016 here. So as prior to the beach fill, you don't see the, the engineered dune. But you could see a long-term trend from the blue when we started in 86 to the lower, uh, to 2016 and the lowering of the profile. And then as well as you can see the changes in the volumes, the long-term erosional trends in the volumes. In Atlantic City, Atlantic City has been pretty stable since um, uh, 1986, and especially since the beach fill in 2004. Um, Atlantic City, uh, this site withstood uh, Hurricane Sandy waves, and there were no damages um, due to the um, beach fill activities there. You can also see the long-term trends of the elevation of the beach has, as it has gained through time. And then last, at North Wildwood in Cape May County, North Wildwood is, uh, this site is located on the northeast corner of uh, the Barrier Island, and we see um, the similar trend of sites that are located close to an inlet on the northeast corner of the barrier because they're influenced by the waves coming from the northeast as well as the inlet processes itself, especially an inlet that doesn't have any jetties to maintain that um, part of the shoreline. Um, this site, if you look at the lower left, you can see the long-term landward movement and lowering of the profile, uh, as well as seen with the, the lower right um, figure, too. And our, um, this site has not had any beach nourishment projects. However, this site has uh, received some sand through sand backcasting, and that's where they've taken sand from the storm drains at uh, Wildwood and truck them up to the beach here at North Wildwood. So um, the impact to the beaches um, caused by the pandemic is pretty minimal because um, our beach changes are driven by weather and waves and tides, uh, but we have observed some changes between spring 19 and spring 20. Um, so our normal, you see the Longport um, photo on the left, and you can see so that that's a, a normal beach, a, nor, a typical beach for um, the winter. Uh, we have seen um, the municipalities start preparing for um, the, the spring and some, late spring and summer season uh, by clearing out um, access points and just general maintenance of the beach. Uh, some hypothetical days, our, our teams have seen more dolphins in the water, uh, maybe because they're the only ones out there and the dolphins are curious. Um, there's also a lot of house and road construction in these beach communities. And then there's uh, a lot of people out on the beach now, um, some uh, social distancing and some not, some just taking advantage of the warm days um, since we've had very few of them this spring. So I want everybody to be safe. I know we're all w we're wanting to get out and get the sand between our toes and, and breathe that fresh air. But I want everybody to be safe. Um, 
uh, this if you this is our website information. If you look at the the lower here the link here the web link that's to our profile viewer. So you can go there and if you have a favorite beach in New Jersey and you want to see how these long term trends are, uh, we update this every year and you can compare beaches from year to year. So with that, I am finished and we'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kim, um, and getting us in right before the end. So that's great. Uh, so, Carl, I don't know if you've been monitoring the, the chat room, but I've seen some questions pop up that have been answered by our speakers in the chat. Right. Uh, yeah, that's that's right. Um, one that I see here that hasn't been answered, which I, I believe was directed to Lewis, comes from Tiffany Medley from here at Monmouth University, who says, um, I'm teaching an air pollution course in spring 2021. Would the DEP be able to release the air monitoring station data for 2020 by February of 2021 so we could do comparison analyses like this? Hi, uh, this is Lewis, and um, sure, we can, we can talk about that. Um, the data, of course, is preliminary data is available on our website. If you navigate to that website, there is a place where you can look at summaries and actually um, fairly recent data. But if, uh, if you could just get in touch with me, um, we can certainly talk about sharing data. Well, that's great. Um, any other ones, Carl, that you see? Or do, does anybody have a burning question to post in the chat? Um, I am coming through, and it looks like the ones that have come in so far were, um, were answered. There was a request of whether um, presenters would, uh, whether slides from this uh, webinar would be available afterward. And um, I said that would be the case. Our whole recording will be on the Urban Coast Institute website probably by tomorrow. But certainly, are there any questions if people can type them in? I think I see some people are typing really quick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> pop up. I want to be mindful of everybody's time, so uh, but we can get one or two questions in. That would be great. Oh. So in the, in the meantime, as we get these one or two questions, um, I really appreciate everybody participating in the webinar today. Um, uh, I think we had a pretty good turnout. I saw at one point over 40 attendees, so that's uh, quite exciting for us, Carl. Sure. Um, and especially our panelists. I would really thank the panelists for taking the time to join us today. I know they're very busy, uh, and it was great to have their view and knowledge of the subject provided to us. I really, really appreciate all your, your interactions. Um, okay, they popped up. Do you want to catch them? Sure thing. So the, the first one is from Glenn, who asks, now that it is shown uh, rapid improvements on air and water since the lockdown, is there a chance that legislation will try to slow the progression of where we were uh, before the lockdown? And for those who are on the line, if you could just mute your computers so that we don't get the echo effect. Anyone want to take a stab at that one? Carl, this is Josh. I um, uh, I will combine that with the next one as well that John asked about. Um, you know, is this providing a new model of environmental action? And I, I think that's one of the points I was trying to raise. Is I think this in all aspects of, of everything the speakers brought up today is. Thinking about we have an opportunity here to, to conduct a natural experiment of a very complex ecosystem that has socioeconomic links, natural links. And so um, I would hope that what we're seeing uh, as we have time to go through the data and understand what variability is linked to COVID, what variability might be linked to some other drivers, that it will inform future legislation, that it will inform what impact legislation might have, or just 
human behavior might have. I think Sean said it really well that there are things that we can do, and I, I know in my own home we're thinking about how behavior might change just in how we're interacting from what we've learned the last two months about ourselves. And so I would hope that this opportunity would not be lost and that there would be uh, action that comes out of this based on the new understanding that we gain. If I can, if I can add to that, um, I think we're, I completely agree with everything Josh mentioned. This is Sean, uh, Sean Starrett. Um, the, I have, I think it's remarkable that we are now uh, a small thing. We are now starting to figure out that we can have um, occasional or uh, every other year uh, virtual conferences with you know some conferences uh, some scientific conferences have been uh, have been canceled some of them are still going on and your conference call will end in 10 minutes or a virtual or a virtual a semi virtual type of, of thing and so um, the the decreases in, in carbon um, uh, uh, carbon emissions that would that would come from that type of, of an event is, is pretty remarkable. So even though that's a small thing, I think we're now learning what's possible um, for us in, in both at our in our homes and regionally, nationally, internationally to reduce carbon emissions um, and, and all the things that come from that. So Josh and Sean, great points. Um, and then how much we're learning from this event and, and what we do with it afterwards will be very important. Um, so uh, we've gone over, as you heard, we only have a couple of minutes left on this conference line. Um, so again, I'd like to thank all the panelists for joining us here today. Uh, it was really spectacular. Thank you guys very much. Um, and uh, hopefully we can focus on a, a better topic in the future, maybe what we learned from this event uh, in a couple of years. So. Um, with that, thank you all for joining, and um, have a pleasant day. Thank you, Tom. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, uh, thanks Carl. Thanks, Tom. Thank thanks, Carl. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you, you, Carl. Thank you, guys. Take care. Thank you. Bats aren't bad. <laughs>